Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining Foley and Lardner and Viridian Capital Advisors for today's webinar titled Restructuring for Success in the Cannabis and Hemp Industry. And now I will turn it over to Scott Greiper of Viridian Capital Advisors for an introduction. Thank you very much. <clears throat> welcome, everybody. Appreciate everybody taking their time out today to join what we think is a pretty, pretty timely and critical topic in today's cannabis and help, hemp world, which is restructuring. Uh, we've seen a lot of this going on in the industry, and uh, what we're focusing on today is not only the right steps for restructuring, but what the goals are, which ultimately should be how to position your company for renewed growth, better access to capital, and ultimately visibility to a successful exit. I uh, want to thank Ron Eppin and his team at Foley and Lardner, Jeff Goodman, Joanne Molinaro, and Lauren Clippel for working with us on this presentation and partnering with us on what will be a series of webinars between our two firms. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is Scott Griper again from uh, Viridian Capital. So just to kind of set up uh, why this webinar now, uh, hopefully many of you saw the announcement uh, about a month or so ago of the launch of the Viridian Capital Restructuring Advisory Practice, which is being headed up by Frank Nuttall, who will do most of the presentation today on Viridian's behalf. Uh, as many of you know, uh, for the good and the bad, over the past year, the cannabis and hemp industries have gone through a, uh, a very painful and sustained period of declining stock prices decreasing valuations, public and private, shrinking capital availability, really a recalibration, the first significant one that the industry has seen. And we've seen the response on the part of public and private companies to this contraction, which has been um, asset sales of non-core assets, debt restructurings, workouts, um, shrinkage in staff, owned facilities, uh, terminations or workouts of previously announced joint ventures or acquisitions, cutting back to the core business. That's what the market is saying to the owner operator today. And so this webinar is really intended to provide guidance uh, on behalf of Viridian and Foley and Lardner to cannabis and hemp company owners, shareholders, operators of the right steps to pursue a restructuring, not for an academic exercise or a saving your asset exercise, but an exercise to getting your company back on a path in a leaner, more profitable platform, as I said earlier, to renew growth and hopefully sustainable growth to be in a better position to attract capital, to support that renewed growth, and to be in a better position to pursue an exit opportunity for the management of your company, the board of your company, and the shareholders of your company. So that's the intent. I hope this is valuable for all of our respondents. Uh, with that, uh, let me hand it over to Frank Nuttall, who is the director of the restructuring advisory practice at Viridian Capital. Thanks, Scott, for uh, the lead-in, and welcome, everyone. Um, as Scott referenced, uh, after a period of high growth, market expansion, and fluid capital markets, our industry has hit an inflection point uh, in early 19, 2019, and we are now in a secular down market. The market's characterized by decline in valuations, significant contraction in access to capital, overextended portfolio of assets and licenses, operating losses, and significant cash flow deficits. And yet, product sales and revenue continue to rise in virtually every state and every market. Uh, as Scott mentioned with our webinar today, we'd like to set forth the process uh, with respect to which restructuring and strategic advisory services can provide the foundation we're getting back uh, on a growth path, getting access to capital, or maximizing value to a successful exit. 
Pulling data from the uh, Viridian deal tracker, uh, there's been a negative trend in the number of financings, more acutely noticeable with respect to equity financings. Uh, debt financings have declined as well to a lesser extent, uh, but have historically and continued to remain in the minority with respect to the number of equity financings. The combined peak for number of financings was the fourth quarter of 2018, when there were 185 combined equity and debt financing transactions. Whereas in the fourth quarter of 2019, there was a combined equity and debt financing transactions totaling 47, which was the recent trough. The number of uh, transactions rebounded uh, a little bit in 2020, uh, but remains well below the, uh, the peak. Uh, more dramatically, uh, we can see here the significant decline in total dollars raised. Relative to 2018, the total amount of money has declined by approximately two-thirds, with data through last week for 2020 annualized for the year. With the difficulties presented by COVID and the recession, um, the impact of financings during the remainder of the year uh, is an open question, uh, but the value of Q2 2020 financings were on par with that of Q4 2019, which is the recent low point. Given the, un the continued uncertainty, this does not bode strongly for the remainder of the year and, and you know, potentially into uh, 2021 as well. At the same time, the average share price for a basket of cannabis stocks declined 61% since the beginning of 2019 at a time when the S&P index rose 16%. The share price decline uh, makes it considerably harder for cannabis companies and hemp companies to raise equity uh, during this time and, and period, and also puts a damper on debt and convertible raises as well. The share price decline is at least partly a result of the industry's failure to meet forecasts. Many of the 2018 financing transactions were sold predicated on 2020 operating results. Uh, as 2019 transpired, however, investors became increasingly aware from interim finance or interim filings that the results wouldn't come close to matching the original forecast, leading investors to depart the space. Compounding the uh, industry's failure to meet forecasts and projections, companies in our space continue to suffer from poor operating performance and high debt levels relative to revenue. Debt as a, revenue, as a ratio of revenue for the 50 largest cannabis and hemp companies on the OTC market are over two times higher than the debt to revenue ratio for operating companies in the S&P 500 index. Further, many companies our space were built assuming continued smooth capital markets and under a land grab mentality. This was done under the premise that expanding both within existing states as well as expanding into new states would be in an environment with plenty of capital and that would be cheaper and more seamless than we have actually seen over the last couple of years. The result of this, as well as the tax drag of 280E and excise taxes, is that companies in our industry have significant negative income and cash flow from operations, driving the need to normalize those operations, restructure the business in order to access capital markets and drive future value. Tight capital markets and poor operating results have led to some early and recently announced restructuring and bankruptcies. Uh, we believe at this point that these are the canary in the coal mine uh, and just the early adopters and early recognizers uh, of financial distress. As, we learn, as we'll learn in more detail when our friends at Foley provide their insight, Canvas companies cannot avail themselves of Chapter 11, as was the case with Gen Canna, a hemp and CBD company filing a bankruptcy in Kentucky, or to a lesser extent, Green Growth, which declared bankruptcy for its Canadian operations and is restructuring its US operations under state laws or outside of a regulatory environment. For cannabis companies, therefore, restructurings have to occur either under a state-governed ABC process, which is an assignment for the benefit of creditors, or more desirably for the long-term success of the company, managed by the company, its agents, or creditors, outside of the regulatory process. Recently announced examples include MedMen and Afria, 
where the companies, either driven internally or via creditor and stockholder pressure, have embarked on a restructuring process, including debt swaps, forbearance agreements, asset dispositions, and staff changes. And yet, this is happening in a flourishing market for our product. Since inception of the legal framework, the U.S. legal market has increased in size every year and is expected to do so for a considerable period of time. This will lead to a span of 15 or more years of yearly successive growth without a decline. This trend can be seen even in mature markets, with Colorado as an example. Over the last five years, the average annual growth rate has been 12% per year, and this has continued into 2020, in that for the first four months of 2020, sales are up 12% as well over the comparable period in the prior year. Pulling this all together, tight capital markets, poor operating results, but an overall growing market, brings us to the thesis where we view restructuring as an important tool to get companies positioned to take advantage of the growing market and prepare themselves to access liquid capital markets when they reoccur and to maximize M&A value. So how do we get there? Recognition is key. Stages can be characterized in three tiers, early, middle, and late. In an early stage crisis, cash begins to tighten, uh, AP is slowed, management and board hope that the markets improve or that operating results improve and defer recognition and any action. In the middle stage, potential material shortage and loss of vendors occur, companies push line of credit limits, enter into suboptimal financings, uh, incur breaches of existing covenants, experience morale issues, and potential employee loss. In the late stage, the situation has reached criticality with overdrawn accounts, uh, management of the cash float, uh, management and finance teams spending all their time uh, bailing out the water and little time actually managing the business, lenders turning debt over to workout departments or push for Chapter 11 or receivership. We view our restructuring advisory services as a change agent to assist companies or creditors institute the necessary changes in response to chill in our market. To reiterate, recognition is key. Addressing distress earlier in the cycle gives companies far more flexibility and time to reorganize the business to adapt to the current environment, as well as allowing the company and its advisors to more rationally address capital or M&A needs. We view the uh, restructuring service as a four-step approach, analyze, stabilize, execute, and perfect uh, to help companies reset for success. We'll discuss in greater detail in, in each of the next slides, but the chart sets forth uh, the high-level points for each step. In the analyze step, uh, we collect relevant data, which involves operational and financial analysis, review of the forecast, and if helpful, development of the forecast and valuation, including impairment analysis for intangibles. It's really key to have a very significant financial and operating dashboard to understand the key and critical components of operating the business as, as a part of developing a strategy to understand how the company needs to adapt to the current environment. In addition to the, the data analysis, uh, we'll review the debt capacity, debt instruments, and capital structure in relation to the company's business plan, all of which wraps up providing the foundation for the preparation of a set of recommendations that we'll provide to be enacted upon to get the company positioned for growth and to provide access to the capital markets. Concurrently, if the company is in the middle or latter stages of financial distress, we can also step in to assist management with the stabilization of the firm's financial resources. This is generally a set of emergency responses to staunch the cash burn, including the tranching of payables, acceleration of AR, normalizing of compensation, potential layoffs, uh, closing of non-performing assets, and forbearance agreements. Uh, in addition, Viridian can assist with uh, interim or bridge financing, allowing for a more logical approach to the restructuring process. The execution is the final step of the uh, restructuring process itself. 
uh, and is meant to set up our clients for a successful outcome and involves the execution of the plans developed in conjunction with the company during the analyze stage. Specifically, we assist the company to restructure both its operational and financial aspects of its business. Uh, on the operational side, this includes management or assistance in reductions in force, office closures, asset dispositions, and brand manufacturing, office cultivation, and other consolidations. On the financial side, in which it is often very helpful to have outside assistance, we assist with renegotiating debt instruments through debt for equity or debt for asset swaps, restructuring of the debt terms, consolidation of multiple de debt, different debt instruments into a new consolidated financing. Uh, our financial restructuring extends to negotiations with taxing authorities and vendors uh, as part of a global effort to um, restructure the balance sheet and the firm's operations. This all leads into the perfect stage, uh, which is the final step um, in, in, in the whole process uh, and the stage in which we wrap Viridian's traditional core expertise of fundraising and M&A advisory around the company. So once the company has been through the restructuring stage and um, asset dispositions, right sizing of the staff, development of a new strategic plan, development of dashboard and financial and analytical tools to manage the company, Viridian can step in uh, with either our fundraising or M&A advisory services uh, to assist the company to reaccess the capital markets or to position itself for an optimal uh, M&A outcome. Specifically on capital raising, uh, Viridian and its principals have considerable expertise in raising all forms of capital for our clients. Included in this are equity financing, pipes, debt and convertible issuances, asset-backed financings, and dip and bridge loans. Uh, overall, Viridian has, has executed 15 financings, totaling $170 million uh, in the cannabis sector. And our principals have raised more than $1.1 billion across 86 financings outside of the cannabis sector. Uh, with respect to M&A advisory, our team has a broad industry network through our experience in the industry, uh, access through our board advisors, and data from the Viridian Deal Tracker to provide an extensive group of potential buyers and acquirees. Uh, to date, we've executed 10 cannabis M&A transactions or M&A dispositions with a total consideration of $390 million and in excess of 100 M&A transactions or asset dispositions across all other industries with total consideration in excess of $1.2 billion. Bringing the discussion back to our restructuring experience before we move on, uh, we've managed restructuring transactions all across the spectrum. Some of the major transactions we've worked on include large debt for uh, asset swap as part of a wind down of a NASDAQ company leading into an RTO with an unrelated third, co third party company. Uh, top to bottom restructuring of a firm leading to the closure of the product line, launch of a new business plan, entering a new end user market, and ultimately leading to the sale of the company to a large player in the industry. Uh, managing a company through a chapter 11 process which included placement of debtor in possession loan and post-bankruptcy financing. On top of these larger transactions, we've managed many instances of forbearance agreements, debt renegotiation, operating changes, asset dispositions, and other restructuring projects. Key members of our team um, are set forth here. Just a short word is uh, before we wrap up and I, and I hand over. Uh, most of the team comes to Viridian from investment banking backgrounds including the likes of Unterberg, Tobin, Duff and & Phelps, and Wells Fargo Securities, uh, and have, at this point, uh, many, many years of experience in the cannabis sector. Uh, Viridian was founded um, uh, five to six years ago and is uh, exclusively in the cannabis and hemp sectors um, and focused on, um, on transactions in that market. For me, I've spent most of my career in, in operating positions at early stage and small cap public companies. Uh, the last three years of which were in cannabis operating roles. Uh, as CFO, I took one of the companies public on the, C, uh, on the Canadian Securities Exchange and subsequently managed the merger with a Canadian operation 
which led to the restructuring of the operation uh, and closure of the management team in the United States. Uh, as I've had the opportunity to work on many of the transactions from the management seat, Viridian brings to our clients the full spectrum of banking and operating experience and provides us with a framework uh, allowing deep understanding of the inner workings of company operations uh, and provides us the ability to truly partner with the management teams of our clients in restructurings, financings, and M&A transactions. Um, just a, a way to reach us here. And now we'll turn it over to Ron. Thanks, Lauren. Um, and uh, thanks again, uh, everybody, for uh, taking some time out of your day today. A reminder that um, Scott, Frank, uh, myself, Joanne, and uh, Jeff will all be available uh, at uh, for the last 20 minutes or so of this presentation to uh, answer various questions. So please, uh, uh, if anything is on your mind, uh, uh, please submit it to the Q&A, and uh, we will do our best to uh, to get to it. Thank you. Um, so, um, uh, brief word about uh, myself. I am uh, one of the co-chairs of Foley and Lardner's cannabis industry practice. Uh, Foley and Lardner, as you may know, is an AMLAW 50 national firm. Uh, we have offices throughout the Midwest, Texas, uh, and up and down the East and West Coast, as well as international offices in Brussels and Mexico City. We're a broad, uh, multidisciplinary legal practice, and we have been active in the cannabis industry since 2014. Uh, and we've been act active in uh, pretty much all aspects of the industry, including corporate securities, uh, m a uh, insurance uh, intellectual property uh, including uh, trademark and even some, some patent matters litigation as well as uh, state focused regulatory and administrative uh, advisory services um, with me today are two of my partners who are principal members of Foley's bankruptcy and restructuring practice uh, Joanne Molinero and Jeff Goodman um, and uh, they, they um, are deep, have general, deep general experience in bankruptcy and insolvency, and uh, they uh, were also lead counsel for the Unsecured Creditors Committee on uh, what we believe is the first Chapter 11 case involving uh, a legal hemp company, uh, uh, Gencana, and uh, both of them, I'm sure, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. Uh, so I just want to set the framework first uh, for uh, what, what we're going to talk about in the, in the sort of two regimes that exist for uh, restructuring. Uh, first is legal hemp, uh, which uh, Gencana USA, which I just mentioned as an example. Those are companies in which uh, they, they can certify that the cannabis which they handle is less than 0.3% THC. Um, and that is uh, that, of course, has to be tested and demonstrated. Uh, companies that are in the hemp category are federally legal uh, per the Farm Bill and and subject to uh, essentially essential interstate treatment as uh, as an agricultural good and and all that that entails. That does mean that hemp companies have access to uh, national market both in terms of sale of their product and uh, access to their supply chain. It also means, most importantly, that uh, that when restructuring is is uh, is on the horizon for a hemp company, federal bankruptcy reorganization is a viable option, um, and one which uh, and one which there have now been uh, a few examples uh, successfully working their way through the federal courts. Uh, what we call what we refer to uh, colloquially as cannabis or high THC cannabis. Uh, means any company that is involved in uh, 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 plants having THC levels above the federally mandated minimum. Uh, this means that products cannot be shipped into interstate commerce, at least not legally, um, and therefore the, uh, the, the, the supply chain for cannabis products and finished cannabis goods uh, is, is isolated state by state. 
Thus, we have, we've not seen the development of a national market for high THC cannabis. Instead, we've seen the de development of uh, a series of independent markets that have developed at various levels depending on whether the state has legalized adult use or remains, um, uh, remains limited to medical. And of course, uh, any, any company that <coughs> has, a, has a meaningful connection with high THC cannabis is, uh, is unable to utilize federal bankruptcy protections. And uh, this, this notion uh, has been proven out uh, a, couple, a few times recently. Uh, I know uh, of a particular example of a vertically integrated uh, cannabis company in uh, Nevada, which uh, tried for Chapter 11 protection uh, in early 2019 uh, and was immediately, uh, immediately kicked out of federal bankruptcy court. We've also seen examples of companies where uh, plant touching activities are but a very small part of a, of a much larger organization, um, and uh, it, it generally appears that uh, any connection with plant touching, um, which, um, um, well, which, can be, which can be visible to the federal courts, will result in federal courts denying jurisdiction. So um, just a few words on well, what is plant touching. Um, that means cultivating, processing, transporting, distributing, or dispensing marijuana. Um, and so some examples of you know, things that would clearly be plant touching are uh, cannabis dispensaries and retailers, cannabis growers and producers, cannabis wholesalers, uh, suppliers who in particular are focused and entirely dependent on the industry, for their products have also been caught up in this net. We have also seen examples of uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, access to banking services um, and, and other related things of, of landlords um, and, and even those who have a, a controlling financial or equity interest in plant touching companies. Uh, similarly, uh, similarly being thrown into the into the uh, plant touching mix here. Um, Jeff, thank you, thanks, Ron. This is uh, Jeff Goodman, and I want to talk a little bit about hemp workouts. And, and it's important because we're going to talk hemp workouts, and I want to kick it back to Ron for cannabis workouts. Is to, to say what do we mean by a workout? That's that's the important thing to start with. And a workout means that you're not entering into, at least as I'm using the term and it's typically used, you're not attempting to, to restructure the company through any kind of proceeding, be that a bankruptcy proceeding, a receivership, uh, a, a, an assignment for the benefit of creditors. That, that'll be, we'll cover those more directly uh, in the second part, a, sec, uh, a future webinar we hope you'll join us with. But a workout means you're working it out with your creditors outside of any kind of process. You're saying, well, the first thing you say is it's outside of a process, and the first thing you, first bullet point you have on the screen is bankruptcy potential, because that's important. The hemp, as, as Ron mentioned, they are hemp companies, so long as they don't qualify as cannabis, they don't, they don't hit the THC level, are eligible to file for Chapter 11. Uh, that was true already. It was borne out by the Gencana matter, which we represented the committee. And that means, and that's important to a workout. Because both sides, whether it's the company or whether it's creditors, know there's a possibility that the company could go into bankruptcy. So if you're not able to work it out, some part of that asset value that could go to constituents is going to go to people like me, you go know, to lawyers. Uh, it's going to go to it's going to go to court costs. It's going to go to fees to the to the United States government and part of the Department of Justice. It's not going to go to the constituents. So that that is something that hangs over. Uh, a workout process. And, and it actually, it, 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 as we'll get to it for cannabis, it can actually be a benefit and a drawback uh, to, to have the possibility of going into bankruptcy. Uh, with, in, in a hemp workout, the, you're going to have a lot of different constituents. Most, that's true of many companies, but particularly true in these industries. You're going to typically have a secured lender. Uh, and unlike in many other industries outside of the, uh, outside of the sector, you're not having traditional banks for the most part. It's mostly hedge funds, equity funds, and the like. Uh, so they may be those that are secured lenders, but may have warrants and other equity rights as well. You've got secondary secured lenders who may have mortgages, 
equipment land lien holders. I'm mentioning going down a bit in terms of the farmers. You have, you have in this situation, you may have farmers who are going to be both integral to the enterprise in terms of making money in the future, and also may have lien rights with respect to at least asserted lien rights, and maybe they're successful with respect to the crops that they've grown. That is an element that they're going to have to have a seat at the table. If you're not talking to your farmers early, you're not going to be able to talk to them late because they're going to come after you. So you've got to be aware of that dynamic. When you're trying to work something out out of court, you don't want it to break down. You want that value to go to constituents and not lawyers. You've got to be aware of that. Um, when we talk about way, ways workouts can be done, they can be done through a debt restructuring uh, where, where it's simple, simply an issue of trying to get your paper more in order. If you jump into the process earlier, as Frank had mentioned in his presentation, you may be able to get through a workout solely by changing the terms of the debt and doing a forbearance agreement with your lender, working out the terms and that type of thing. Obviously, if you're farther along in the process, you may be talking about getting in new investors in the process to take to invest either new debt or new equity, or possibly selling the company. In a minute, we'll get to pitfalls for selling it outside of a bankruptcy process, but that is a possibility in a workout. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to Ron to talk a bit about cannabis workouts. Uh, thanks, Jeff. So, um, you know, as we as as mentioned earlier uh, for uh, companies in the high THC cannabis sector, uh, federal bankruptcy protection is, is, is not a potential option. Um, and so this, this does mean that, um, for the, that, that the parties, the key constituents, which include um, uh, primary secured lenders, um, secondary lenders, uh, landlords, uh, suppliers tr and trade creditors and uh, and even equity investors um, are all going to have to find another way to um, uh, to work things out because the the normal protections that go with reorganization under the bankruptcy code uh, are, are not available and are not likely to become available absent some sort of uh, positive legislative action from uh, from the U.S. Congress. So. Um, the types of actions that are, 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 are typically necessary uh, are, are most often, are, in my experience, are, are, led by prime, are led by the primary secured lenders um, who, who may or may not, under applicable state laws, actually have the ability to execute on the collateral that is pledged to them. But uh, in almost all instances, they do have some level of pretty direct uh, control over the company's cash flow, uh, such that, such that if they want to, uh, they they can largely force some sort of reorganization to occur. Um, these the these reorganizations are, uh, typically take the form of restructuring of the debt, um, as Jeff mentioned. Um, oftentimes, extending the payment schedule, and oftentimes providing for uh, additional cap, uh, debt capital to flow into the company. Um, a, a phenomenon that I'm sure many of you are familiar with is, is the fact that um, a, a number of, of, of cannabis companies have a large amount of debt on them. Um, in some instances, too large, too large an amount of debt, on, uh, too large an amount of debt for them to properly service it. Um, and the exposure that secured lenders have uh, to individual companies is, is often extremely high. Uh, these secured lenders, of course, are not normally banks or, or other traditional financial institutions. Oftentimes, they are alternative debt funds or, uh, or even collections of angel investors or, um, uh, or, or, or family office type investors. And so um, uh, the, the, the financial exposure that they feel uh, in, a, in a company that, uh, that is in trouble is, um, is very real. Um, I wanted to just you know just say a few words about um, about my experience in uh, in working with companies that are approaching the the the, the workout juncture. Um, I've I've been involved in the industry since 2014. Uh, I've worked on a number of uh, early stage and mid stage financings. Have also worked with companies uh, who were part of the gold rush into listing in Canada. Uh, on the on the CSE in particular, 
uh, during 2018 and 2019, and, I, and I've seen the evolution of the of expectations over the over that period of time. Um, and, and one thing that I've noticed in companies that uh, are starting to hit this uh, are starting to hit these uh, these op these inflection points, if you will. Uh, they tend to have some attributes in common. Um, oftentimes, I see that they have um, very concentrated board and management control. Um, oftentimes, uh, uh, the, the, the board is in the hands of the original founders or uh, the original founders and uh, the original investors. Um, it, generally, a small group and generally very limited to non-existent participation by uh, independent, unaffiliated members of the board of the directors. There also oftentimes is management insulation from uh, and a lack of accountability to shareholders, lenders, and, uh, and other stakeholders. Uh, oftentimes also there are less than optimal internal controls and governance and uh, a tendency toward uh, lack of transparency in, um, in financial reporting. And, um, and, and all of these things, all of these factors uh, can really be exacerbated by a, a plant-touching company that is heavily reliant on, uh, on cash transactions. Um, and in particular, I've seen an example of, I've, I've seen more than one example of companies where uh, the, the, the opaqueness of financial reporting and uh, the high levels of cash uh, that have moved through the business have um, have just proven to be too much temptation for uh, people involved in management and um, um, and other pieces of the enterprise. So with um, with that, I'll uh, I'll hand it back to Jeff. Thanks, Ron. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the traditional workout advantages, and this could be a, it could be a, a a hemp workout or a cannabis workout. Why, why do it through essentially straight around the table type deal making? Start with, and if you don't take anything from 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 at least what I say, uh, other people may have more more things to say. But take the first bullet point: it preserves value for all stakeholders, and current, including current equity holders. It's not that it's impossible for equity to get money in or a hemp bankruptcy or a receivership or assignment for the benefit of the creditors. I mean, we'll cover that in the next in the next next set, set of these, but it's a much, much harder. When you, the, the, the way to do it is through a workout because equity has the, has the seat at the table. If it gets in early, it can essentially, it can carve itself into the process and maintain the value for itself as well as its creditor constituents. Uh, in, 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 in a way that can't, won't happen a lot or happens a lot less in other alternatives. Ironically, the unavailability of a federal bankruptcy alternative with cannabis actually enhances the possibility of doing a workout. Believe it or not, it's easier to do it when you can't go into bankruptcy, arguably, than it is in companies that can. You can't keep holdouts, and I'll get, we'll get to that in a moment, but it, it means people understand that they can't just go into Chapter 11 and see where the chips fall. They really have to get creative and try to find solutions. It allows that creativity to take place, and we want to be a part of that. It also, you know, some of the other points, it avoids the race to the courthouse, right? around destructive behavior, or getting rid of, again, it's lawyers, it, it's, it's transferring value from constituents to lawyers. And it also, here's an important one to talk about with, with, any, with some of your creditors if you're in trouble. It, you're, you're going to minimize licensing regulatory issues if you, tr if you attempt to transfer a workout in which current equity remains in place is not going to have the kind of licensing issues, regulatory issues that you're going to have if you attempt to some, have some kind of cons uh, transaction, whether in or out of bankruptcy, that has new ownership. And also, the last part is there's no successor liability issues. If, if equity remains in charge, there's not an issue whether a successor should be liable for the debts of its predecessor. Next, I want to talk a little bit quickly about potential obstacles to the workout. Um, this is the first one Frank mentioned earlier. I mentioned it earlier. How matters broken down already. Get started early. It is workouts are about trust because people are are getting around the table and cutting the deal. It is incredibly more likely to be able to do that before people hate you. Uh, if you do it earlier, you're not going to do it the first sign of trouble. I understand that. No one ever does. But if you wait too long, you've already lost that trust. If you've lost that trust, you can't get a deal. And if you can't get a deal, equity is less likely to stay in the money. 
Uh, another option, again, is a holdout creditor issue. You can't force someone to love you. You can't force someone to sign a workout agreement. So you have, that's one problem. You have to deal with it in a workout. Sometimes you can pay somebody off if they're small enough, even if it's just for being difficult. If they're big, you can't, that makes it an obstacle. Uh, uh, there's some issues in terms of debt forgiveness tax. I'll, we'll cover that some other time. The last thing is there's an inability to wash certain debt. Uh, if you have a lot of unsecured debt that you can't get people to the table, a bankruptcy, potentially an assignment for the benefit of creditors, can avoid that debt and start fresh. Obviously, if the debt gets too much and you can't get them to the table, you, 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 an inability to wash that debt can be a huge uh, uh, sticking point. Um, briefly, in terms of an, an alternative to work out being a friendly sale, uh, and, and I say a friendly sale, so what we mean by this is in bankruptcy, you do a sale and the bankruptcy court approves it. And it's free and clear of claims. The court approved stamp and the new company takes over. An option in the workout is a sale outside of bankruptcy. Uh, it, it, you may be able to, if you can't get the creditors who are holdouts from my last slide to agree, you just sell the company to a newly created entity uh, that that uh, that may be some conglomeration of, of, of former lenders and investors who then take over the business. That avoids the holdout issue. They can't stand in your way. Uh, uh, the problem with that is uh, is that you do have issues in terms of are you held, are you success, liable as a successor for that issue? Could there be some kind of fraudulent transfer? Did the old company get fair value for it? Uh, is there going to be? Can you have a truly have a fresh start because you have companies that want to sue you for saying that 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 this was truly some kind of fraudulent sale or successor sale? There are ways to minimize that. It may be the best alternative if you can't get holdouts to agree, but certainly there are issues for a friendly sale that don't exist in a bankruptcy context. And with that, I want to hand it over to Joanne. Sure. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and we definitely want to save some time for Q&A. We see that um, people are uh, submitting questions, so I am going to try and speed through the remainder of these slides. You will have access to this deck even after this presentation is over, so you can refer back to it. But I do want to touch on just a couple of issues here that I think are unique to hemp and or cannabis. And just mention that one of the benefits of doing a workout, i.e. outside of a regulatory environment or outside of a proceeding, is that you can sort Sort of push through some of the quote red tape, um, you know, the regulatory issues, licensing transfers. That said, as I think many of you uh, who are on this uh, CLE know, uh, the regulatory issues can be mind bogglingly Byzantine in this industry. And the hardest thing is that, of course, it's a moving target. Um, you know, the municipalities. Uh, are changing their policies and their regulations, their guidelines, their rules, their ordinances every week. Um, you have to like have a Google alert just to stay on top of what is happening. And so, um, you know, do be mindful of that, that any type of restructuring, particularly capital restructuring, um, can trigger a certain specific ordinances depending on where the licenses are. So just a couple of examples that I've been seeing. Um, I don't know, many of you may know that LA, uh, the city council has now backed uh, a massive potential reform to the social equity rules uh, regarding cannabis licenses. And these, uh, this rehaul is essentially triggered by what has been termed as predatory practices by investors. Um, social equity is gonna be a big thing. And that's largely a function of what's happening in our world right now. Uh, and cities like LA, uh, Chicago, and many other um, bigger cities throughout the country are now sort of embracing what they believe is their role uh, to kind of promote the social applicants. And so it's important to be mindful of where the city is at um, whether it's something that's on the horizon or, you know, what sort of regulatory sort of pitfalls there might be uh, to make sure that any transfers of licenses uh, that are contemplated by virtue of restructuring um, are going to satisfy those issues. Um, we put in here a slide on successor liability issues. I'm not going to really go into that. Um, I think the whole idea here is because unless you're in hemp, 
Um, for a cannabis sale, you're not going to have a 363 clear, free and clear order, which is sort of the gold standard of sale orders. And as a result of that, again, you're going to have to do a state-by-state -state analysis of what are the potential success or liability issues, depending on the kind of workout and or, quote, friendly sale that is contemplated. Um, and, and we already kind of mentioned fraudulent transfer. Jeff, I don't know if you wanted to say anything more on that. No, let's, let's get ready to jump to Q&A. Okay. Uh, and we also included just a couple of slides here on DNO issues. This applies across the board. It's obviously not unique to hemp and cannabis. Uh, these are just a couple of slides for directors and officers who are potentially in an insolvency situation that they need to be mindful of. The biggest thing, takeaway here, is that if you are a DNO and you are concerned that your company may be insolvent, you really need to start thinking about, well, who are my fiduciary duties to? They are no longer limited to your share shareholders. They expand to creditors as well, whether or not the company ultimately files for bankruptcy, because obviously in the case of cannabis, they cannot. And uh, with that, uh, you know, we are not going to discuss the alternatives to bankruptcy right now unless it's in response to a question. I do want to open the floor uh, to uh, Q&A. Okay, so this is, this is Frank. The first question is, cannabis restructurings are clearly on the uptick, but so far it seems to be due, due to the continued lack of financing available rather than due to economic based deterioration of the industry's financial performance. Do you expect this to change as the economy continues to be exceptionally weak? Um, in, in response to that, in, in our perspective, the, um, I think the industry should be prepared for a you know, relatively long period of chilled capital markets. And I think the absolutely key and most important thing to understand based on our experience working through industry, um, you know, early, early stage industries in the past, where you, which are often characterized by periods of high growth, uh, very fluid capital markets, large number of investment transactions and invested dollars, uh, oftentimes followed by a retrenchment uh, before, even in growing markets, before companies themselves get back uh, into, into growth mode. And so I think it's important to understand that there will be a uh, chill in the capital markets for cannabis um, for some period of time. Uh, you know, it, it's undetermined what period of time it is, but the key and most important thing to um, understand is that when we get to the other side of the chilled capital markets, uh, investor appetite will not be the same that it was back in 2017 and 2018. There'll be a lot more discriminating review uh, and analysis of the companies. So the companies that make it through the, the chilled period um, and have access to the capital markets afterwards are those that are going to have better operating performances, better governance, management, uh, better financial results. And the marginal players that might limp through this period are, are going to remain, um, you know, in limbo with respect to the capital markets, even once uh, the capital markets reopen. So I think we're in a period where it's going to remain chill for a while. And when we come out the other side, uh, only the better managed companies will be subject to, um, you know, subject to analysis and investment, um, investment dollars. Great. Um, the next question we have is, is it, is it possible to do a partial ABC, i.e. just for one or a few assets versus the whole business? It's a buyer who wants some protection uh, when buying a distressed asset and a 363 sale in bankruptcy isn't possible. And does an ABC insulate against state law fraudulent transfer claims? Um, now, first thing, ABC is a creature of state law. So every state is different. Some states don't even have it. But I've never seen, generally speaking, in, a, in ABC means that the distressed company assigns all of its assets to an assignee for the benefit of creditors, not just a piece. That said, if they did that in a distressed situation, the assignee doesn't have to sell the business as a whole. You certainly can approach that assignee who gets those distressed assets and say, I just want to buy one or two of them. You're not required to buy the whole business, and, and, and that is certainly in the right circumstances an option. Uh, the 
in terms of the protection, ABCs the are, are, are they're not the gold standard, as Joanne says, for bankruptcy court orders in terms of no free and clear. But if an assignee gets it, it's someone who does this. In many cases, states it's through a court process, not all. But even if it's outside of a court process, your chances of a fraudulent transfer risk in an ABC isn't zero, but it's very low. Uh, not gold standard. Let's call it the silver standard. Turning to our next question, uh, the question is significantly reducing exercise prices on convertible bonds is a way to essentially do a debt for equity swap. Given that many cannabis companies have large amounts of converts outstanding, do you think this technique will become more common? What are the impediments to using this technique? So in response to the first part of that question, the answer is absolutely yes. As, as we set forth uh, at various points uh, earlier in our presentation, the debt level relative to revenue uh, is much higher than the S&P uh, operating companies. It's also, frankly, um, unserviceable in many respects because companies are um, not only have negative net income, but they're actually losing cash flow from, from operations. So companies' abilities to service debt um, is is uh, down considerably, and as part of the level of debt on the balance sheet, frankly, it needs to be brought back into some greater semblance of, of normality. So I think it will absolutely be part of the toolkit uh, that we can assist companies with, uh, with developing and employing to, um, to restructure the outstanding debt. Um, with respect to the impediments themselves, um, a lot of it goes back to, uh, to a point that Jeff may, made, which was trust. Um, in my experience in um, the cannabis sector and in other sectors in general, when you reach a point where you are in distress and you need to restructure your operations or your financial instruments, oftentimes management doesn't realize it quickly enough and enters into the middle or latter stages of financial distress, at which point uh, they've you know, potentially irritated um, investors and vendors to the point where those investors and vendors no longer have any trust in them. So the biggest impediment is trust, and that's actually one of the real benefits and values in bringing in a third-party advisor, is that they're more objective um, and frankly, um, aren't, aren't going into a, a discussion or a negotiation um, in a whole. So, um, A, I think it's uh, very likely that um, that practice will continue, and, and I think the biggest impediment, frankly, is trust and, and the value that, that a third-party advisor can bring to it. We also had another question. Um, in a U.S. cannabis workout situation, what rights leverage does an unsecured creditor such as trade debt have? I'm not going to sugarcoat it and tell you that there's a great situation for unsecured creditors uh, outside of a bankruptcy, even within a bankruptcy, as as we have seen in uh, in hemp cases. Um, but you know, the biggest lever that I can think of is, of course, litigation. Um, this is a commercial situation. It's a commercial dispute, whether you are operating under a supply agreement, a PO, or any other kind of, you know, contract or pseudo contract. Um, those lead to claims. And in many situations, as far as I've seen, um, it is a default under a secured credit agreement uh, for the debtor to be in litigation. Uh, to you know, and to have litigation against it, and obviously, um, you know, separate and apart from having to deal with a like to just dispute with a trade creditor, the potential of defaulting under their primary secured lending agreement can be a big, big, big deterrent, uh, you know, for the debtor and may incentivize the uh, the debtor or the cannabis company to work with trade creditors. I would also say, obviously you know, collective action, if the trade creditors can get with like suppliers and like vendors who are similarly situated to exert pressure on that company through litigation or the threat of litigation, which could lead to ultimately a receivership uh, over that company, that again is a fine, uh, you know, lever uh, or, you know, bargaining power that you may be able to utilize.
So we have an additional question from from uh, one of the attendees that I think is probably a little more appropriately answered by Jeff or Joanne. Um, and that is, has an assignment for the benefit of creditors worked as a restructuring alternative in that the license issue could be a bar as compared to a receivership? That's a really good question. Um, and, and, you know, to be honest, um, ABCs are just an imperfect solution. Um, and it, it, I hate to use the lawyer answer here, but it can really depend upon what the circumstances are that caused the distress to begin with um, and who the receiver is going to be um, and who the assignee is going to be. But you're absolutely right. I think that a receiver such a receivership situation is likely going to be better when it comes to dealing with the regulatory landmines of license, you know, qualification, license eligibility, and license transfer, as we kind of talked about, those are singularly unique to the cannabis industry. And assinees often are going to have much more trouble with that because they're, they're sort of the equivalent of a Chapter 7 trustee in a bankruptcy. They don't necessarily have institutional knowledge of either the company or industrial knowledge to make them experts in, well, how do I deal with cannabis licenses? Whereas a receiver, um, oftentimes the company together with its you know lender, who oftentimes is the one who puts the company into receivership, um, they can exercise some control over who the receiver is going to be, and hopefully that receiver has some know-how in the industry to navigate some of these issues. One one last thing I'll add to that, this is Jeff, is that, you know, he, 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 in saying it for them for the creditors, is treated as a sale of substantially all the assets, even though it really isn't in the real sense. It's really kind of a transfer to effectuate a, a distribution. But you have you have a you have what's deemed a transfer. Uh, so you you have the things you can do about about having the company hold the license while you kind of flip it over to the buyer. Uh, it gets tricky with the assignment process. I, I think there's probably ways with with with, with very experienced SEDs where you can structure it, but it it it, 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 it it's, it's 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 a tricky situation for sure in a way that other other situations are not. Okay, guys, uh, this is Scott Griper from Viridian. I think we've reached the magic 60-minute mark. So uh, thank you, everybody, for participating. Um, uh, Viridian Capital and Foley and Lardner are appreciated. We're happy to be presenting this webinar as the first in a series of webinars that our two firms will be providing. Uh, so keep an eye out for additional uh, notices of the next uh, webinar in this series. Uh, the uh, webinar itself and the PowerPoint presentation will be made available to all of the folks that uh, participated with us today. So keep an eye out for that as well. And uh, hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much.